seven generations to come as we behave in the world. Now I've seen this extraordinary perspective only among the old peoples of America, the Hopi, the Pueblo Indians, but I've actually never seen it in a white woman before. You're the first. Um, so let me introduce the author of The Blue Sweater and my inspiration, Jacqueline Novogratz. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bruce, and thanks to everyone here. Um, Bruce has actually been a big inspiration of mine as well. Um, when I was first starting Acumen Fund, he was one of the few journalists that really saw in it opportunities to connect to the mainstream, um, and so did a really big piece in Business Week that changed our lives and got me really focused on the power of design and innovation and how it connects to our work. And so, the work that he's done in journalism and now in teaching, as well as the work with Native Americans. It's been a really great journey that we've had together, so thank you for everything. And I just want to acknowledge my colleague, Anne McDougall, who is helping to, bid, to build Afternoon Fun. Um, after a long career uh, with Price Waterhouse, came to Acumen Fund, and so the, one of the other pieces of this is that there's always new chapters in your life. There's always new things to do. So. There may be questions that I throw in. She may have to leave early, but otherwise I'm going to throw some questions. And I'm really glad, um, President Montana, you're here with us. Um, so I have the story of the blue sweater, but I tell it every year at Bruce's class, so I'm not telling it to you guys. Um, instead, I've been thinking a lot about last year when I came and spoke to the class, and a year later, and how the world has changed in my life personally, as well as on the globe. And um, just a few of the big things that have happened. Uh, I'm, I'm famous for not doing a good job taking vacations. I was really going to take one this summer when the floods in Pakistan happened. In 
to go to Pakistan and see 20 million people displaced, which is really biblical. It's really extraordinary. It was so fundamentally earth-shattering to me, not only because this was the result of bad policy, bad markets, no planning, um, and, and climate change, but also because I felt like this was my family. This was happening to people I really cared about, how different that was. And then recently, Egypt and what it's meant, this idea of liberating. And you didn't hear young people in Egypt saying, we want a little bit more income. Their call was for dignity. Their call was for freedom. Their call was to be connected. And again, Afternoon Sun has invested in Egypt. And so we had friends at Dadir Square the whole time, and again, feeling so connected. And then most recently, Japan, where um, the earthquake and the tsunami and now the aftershocks have created such unbelievable devastation. And we have an afternoon fun chapter in Japan, in Tokyo, and have been in contact with those young people. And one of the big insights from all of this, for me, has been that the more people that you dare to open yourself to, the more people you dare to care about, the more painful parts of your life will be, but also the more um, meaningful those, those parts will be. And I think it's Part of what Bruce is talking about when he talks about the seven generation and how in many of the tribes the way they would make decisions was to literally imagine the faces of seven generations of children looking at them as they were discussing, as they were making their decisions. Oops, sorry. Um, sorry about this, guys. But, so with that as the backdrop, how precious our life is, how much we need each other, and why we need to think much more seriously about our systems. I also wanted to talk about crossroads and how, we, how I personally got to the idea of patient capital, the idea of acumen fund, and I know that some of you are thinking about that in the context of your life, too. So I thought I would actually start to talk about crossroads. And as I said before, we think that crossroads happen when we're 22 and when we're 30 and when we're 35 and maybe then they end. Um, but they just keep going on throughout life, and it's actually the good news that it's always a new chapter. The first course crossroads I want to talk about those when I was a senior at the University of Virginia. And I had to work my way through university. I was a bartender. I worked all the time, like 40 hours a week while I was in school. And so I was so burned out from working that I said to my mother and father, when I graduate from university, I'm going to take a year off and I'm going to ski. And um, my parents being very wise, uh, while they thought that was a terrible idea, they said that it was fine as long as I agreed to uh, go through the interview process. And I did, so I bought a gray suit, one, and I put my application, my resume, which had a foreign affairs and economics major, into those boxes that accepted those majors. And so my first and only interview at University of Virginia was Chase Manhattan Bank. So I go into this interview, and there's this really cute guy sitting across the table from me, and he leans over and he says, so tell me, Jacqueline, why do you want to be a banker? And I said, as someone who's a really bad liar, um, well, actually, I have no interest in being a banker. I really want to change the world, but right now I'm burned out from work, so I'm going to go skiing for a year. But my parents are making me do this. <laughs> and the guy kind of he literally looks back, and he's like, well, that is just too bad, because if you got this job, you would be in 40 countries in the next three years learning all about the economic and political systems of this world we live in. And I was like, oh, God. All I ever wanted to do my whole life was travel all around the world and learn about the political and economic system. So I was like, do you think that maybe we could start this interview over? And he said, sure. So I literally walked out the door. I knocked on it. I introduced myself. I sat down. And he said, so tell me, Jacqueline, why do you want to be a banker? And I said, Ever since I was six years old, all I ever wanted to do was be a banker. And um, I got the job uh, for some reason that I would never understand, but always appreciate. And so my first lesson is sometimes your body tells you to just turn course and do it. Just do it. Um, it was the most extraordinary three years of my life up to that point. I did go to 40 countries all over the world, and it was during the, the banking crisis of the early 1980s, and I learned that I loved banking. I learned, I loved taking money and investing in a business person and watching that create jobs. I loved learning how the supply chains worked. I loved thinking about the economy. But when I was in Brazil, in Rio, 
during the banking crisis where we were writing off hundreds of millions of dollars that were given to elites, often for about three minutes, then they would move the money to the Cayman Islands. It struck me that there was something really unfair in the overall system. I love Brazil. I love the color. I love the people. I love the, the, the vibrancy. But the fact that the poor and even the middle class couldn't even walk into the doors of the bank, let alone think that they were going to get a loan, felt really unfair to me. So I went to my boss, and I told him that maybe we would get our money back and do good things for Brazil if we lent to this population. And he literally, a week later, gave me a book called The Innocent Anthropologist. Um, and so that was another turning point in my life, and I decided that, well, I loved, I loved Chase, I loved working at the bank, what I really needed to do was go and see what it meant to try to lend to the poor. I wrote Dr. Yunus at the Grameen Bank. At that time, it took 10 days for a letter to uh, get there. I wrote to a woman named Ila Bhatt in India, and I wrote to a woman named Michelle, not, Michaela Walsh in New York City that was running Women's World Banking. And I said, I'll do anything to get to Brazil. I really want to work on microfinance. But Brazil wasn't in the cards for me. And, they, um, and she offered me instead to go to Kigali, Rwanda. Um, well, to go to Africa. And I ended up in Kigali, Rwanda. And that next lesson for me was prioritize what your real dreams are. I love Brazil. But what I really wanted was to learn how to do banking for low-income people. I never thought I would end up in Rwanda. Um, it was a beautiful place, but a place I had frankly never heard of. I couldn't have found it on a map. But it was also one of the most important places in my life. Um, I ended up working with five Rwandan women. These aren't all of them. But this woman here, Agnes, played a very important part. She was our first um, executive director. And uh, it was a heady time. Within a year, we started banking to the unbanked women. And within three years, we had we were the biggest lenders in the country. And simultaneously, I started a bakery. Um, and I saw that a small group of people really can change the world. But you can imagine in 1994, uh, a few years after I had left Rwanda, what it felt like to see the genocide um, of Rwanda in the New York Times, wondering what had happened to the people I had worked with that I cared so much about, um, wondering what had happened to the institution that I had founded. and. Um, as it turned out, Agnes, the woman in the white, um, was the Minister of Justice under the genocide regime. She was one of the most vitriolic speech makers and leaders of the genocide that ultimately killed 800,000 people. And so I decided, and other women in our group were killed on that first day or they saw their families being killed. So it made no sense. How could this group of women who deliberately set out to, to build a, an institution of social justice do such terrible things as well as such incredibly good things. Um, I decided to go try to understand the human spirit, and I found myself sitting on prison floors with Agnes, asking. And what I discovered is that monsters do exist, but not in the way we too often think that they might, but instead they're in all of us, um, and they're really the broken parts of us, the fragments. And I realized how easy it is often for demagogues to prey on those broken parts and those fragments and make us blame those things we don't like on ourselves and other people and often do really terrible things. And that was really the beginning of my writing of the book. But over time, I also decided that it was time to put my words and thoughts into action and not just focus on the human spirit. And so in 2001, we started Action and Fun. But it was based on these lessons that I had learned at this point over 20 years, um, and many of them in Rwanda. And the first is that dignity is more important to the human spirit than wealth. Too often, economists especially try to measure everything in terms of dollars. If you make $1.17, you're poor. If you make $3, you're not. But today in the United States, black males live 11 years shorter than Bangladeshi men making $2 a day. We've got to think more broadly about how we define poverty. And from my perspective, the more I work in this area, the more it really boils down to, do you have choice? Do you have quality of decisions? Can you make your own decisions? And certainly, that's what we saw um, in Egypt. The second is that our systems, that, so that often makes us move over and say, well, let's get charity, let's give aid. But our systems of development, our systems of aid that are top down too often don't work. In fact, they often create dependency rather than dignity 
in part because we think we have the answer to people's problems. And I know you guys are in a design class, and that's what you study. But the market ideology that we saw in the first decade of the 21st century is also wrong. And while we've seen literally more people lifted out of poverty over the last 20 years, almost a half a billion, primarily in China and India, we're also seeing 2% of the wealthiest people own 50% of the wealth. And 50% and of the poorest people have less than 2%. That's unstable. And we can, the biggest thing, the biggest change, and it's changing more and more every day, is that we can see each other. We understand whether we're in the rich or the poor. And I actually think that we're starting to see two worlds. The global elite that are more like each other across lines of national difference and the rest of the world than they are, that, than the elites are with people who are living in their own countries but are poor. So acumen, this go, is going way too fast, but acumen is um, what we call a nonprofit venture capital fund for the poor. We're trying to think, uh, help the world build a world beyond poverty by investing in companies, leaders, and ideas. And what we do is we work in the basics, water, healthcare, housing, alternative energy, agriculture, inputs. And we raise philanthropic money, but instead of giving it away, we invest loans and equity in companies that see the poor not as passive recipients of charity, but as full-bodied human beings that want to make their own decisions. As they build their models, and sometimes it can take 5, 7, 10, 15 years to do so by the time we get our money back, as they build their model, we are able to articulate not only what returns come back financially, but increasingly the social impact. And in some cases, it becomes a model not just for the private sector, but for government as well. So I want to give you a couple of examples of that. Um, at Acumen Fund, it always starts with people. Often the entrepreneur that, can, that dreams that they can do the impossible um, and turn it into the possible. This guy named, is named Guy Nishpande. He's from Bihar, which I'll tell you about the biggest state in India, also the poorest. He was educated at the best schools in India, and then he went on to get an engineering degree at Rensselaer Polytech. Worked in semiconductors, and at some point decided, I need to go back to Bihar, where I grew up, because the energy problem is so bad, nobody's trying to solve it, and I think I can. Now, Bihar is the second, um, is the poorest country in, is the poorest state in India. And so when Hans Rosling, the sociologist, talks about the fact that there is no longer the developed world in the developing world, what he means is you take a country like India that's moving so many people out of poverty and we have 40 billionaires now. In Bihar, the average per cap capita income is $200 per person per year. If you put Bihar on the African map, it would be the second poorest country and the second largest country, 90 million people. And even more important, 22,000 villages in Bihar have been written off by government as economically impossible to reach by conventional means. That's about 80 million people who have essentially been consigned to buying kerosene, which sometimes takes 10, 15, 20% of their monthly income. Um, it's very dangerous. It's very dirty. It throws off 100 million tons of carbon on aggregate into the environment. It makes no sense anymore as an energy. But nobody had figured out how to build a grid and extend it to people in Bihar. So Ganesh did what a lot of entrepreneurs do. He started with what he thought might work. Solar, disaster. Jatropha, disaster. And finally, he wakes up one morning and he realizes he's in the rice belt. This is a part of Bihar, of India, that where everybody grows rice. Um, and nobody had really seen the rice husk, the husk that holds the rice, as economically valuable. So he decides that he's going to buy the rice husk from the local farmers and see if he can gasify it and create a system where he could then sell it at, by creating these little mini grids um, to villagers in the area. This is what the gasification unit looks like. And one of those will, will reach about 10,000 people or about three villages. And he knows that he's got to design his infrastructure in incredibly inexpensive ways. So bamboo sticks and essentially strings to go to the little houses. And he gets the price down to about a dollar a month. But he can't do it by himself. People look at these investments that Acumen Fund does often, and they feel like, why aren't we a for-profit company? But the way that husk power works is that first he got grant money from Shell Foundation so he could develop the prototype. 
Then he came to Acumen, we couldn't make his business plan work. We couldn't design a business plan that actually would make profits unless you subsidize the capital, the money that he spent on those, those machines at the beginning. And there was one innovator in government at the Ministry of um, Natural and Renewable Energy who agreed to do it. So then you could get a price point down to a dollar a month that people could buy. And what's been so exciting is that we've seen total conversion. Nine, 80 to 90 percent of villages are now buying the electricity from Husk Power. And we're up to about 170,000 people that are getting their houses electrified. And to, for me, who has spent so much of my life working in rural areas where it's so dark you cannot see your hand at night, to suddenly go into these areas and they're all sparkling with light and people are working and studying shows, one, how important energy is to change, but two, that you really can change the world. One guy. Um, here's another young guy that uh, decided he was going to change the world. Shafi Mather and his buddies, um, two of them, both almost lost their mothers because they uh, got, had an emergency and no ambulances came. In India, 90% of people who are in ambulances are dead. If you want to call, take somebody to, a loved person to the hospital, you call a taxi. If you want to go to the morgue, you call an India. You call an um, ambulance. It was the same in the United States till about 1967 when we finally regulated ambulances and insisted that there was a particular quality of technology inside the ambulances and that it wasn't just private sector driven. India is getting there, but it again took a, a private initiative, private capital to build the public model. And what Shafi did with 1298 was decide that he would have three principles. One, he was going to be completely different than the other ambulances. He, it, it's bright yellow. And he was not going to allow any corruption. So when they called to get the number that you would call on the phone from government, like 911, 333, something that people could remember, because they wouldn't pay bribes, they got 1298. And um, he decided, we're going to market our way through it, because we're not doing the corruption thing. The second thing they did was um, decide that the ethos of the company was service for all. So if you're taken to a fancy hospital, you pay. If you're taken to a free public clinic, it's free. And the third was that they would look for ancillary revenues. They were, they, these guys are great marketers. So on the sides of the ambulances are um, corporations advertising. And uh, they, mar they, they sell to all different kinds of railroad stations so that they can really build a for-profit model. What happened in 2008 during the terrorist attacks of Mumbai, I was, it was Thanksgiving Day and I was watching television and, well, because there were terrorist attacks in Mumbai, and what was extraordinary was that in every piece of footage in front of the burning hotels were these yellow ambulances. We had only invested a year before when there were nine ambulances. And again, I saw you can create systemic change if you put enough into these companies and help them grow. Government saw that too. So now, 1298 partners with government, and we've seen that company grow from nine ambulances to 350, uh, 1,300 employees, and in the next two years, they will have 1,500 ambulances and three to 5,000 employees, which means for Acumen, we need to redesign ourselves so that we can keep up with the complexity of the growth of our companies. So the whole system is starting to change together which is really exciting. And then these guys, um, Sam and Ned, Sam Goldman and Ned, Ned Tozen, are Stanford graduates. And while they were at Stanford, Sam, the guy in the arm shirt, had recognized that there was this kerosene problem. He wanted, to, he wanted to find a way to solve it. He'd grown up his whole life in the developing world, primarily in India. And one of his best friends was killed when a kerosene, her, uh, kerosene lamp fell over and burned down uh, the house and his friend. And so, um, he was obsessed with this idea that not creating microgrids where you're going to have huge social impact because you can go from light to other forms of energy, but could you create a consumer product where people could get access to cheap light in a way that they valued and, and, and uh, could afford. And this D-Light, the first lamp came out at about $36 and you can charge a cell phone and get a lot of light in your house and people loved it but it was way too expensive for the rural villager to afford. And so they had to keep developing new prototypes, changing it, changing it, changing it. They just come out with a $6 
uh, prototype. It looks like a flashlight. Um, and what they do is you can hang it on your house in the morning, uh, in the morning, and there's a little solar panel on the top, and it will regenerate the battery, and then the, the, the light will work all night long. So mothers thought that their children would study more, which they do, but the kids often want to keep it lit all night, focused on the side of the house, just so that the house feels a little safer. So it's, again, it's really transforming lives. And for me, as someone who's tried to work on solar stuff in the 80s and the 90s, believe it or not, um, and it was just a disaster because, again, it was top down. You'd come into a village and you're like, here's this huge solar plant that no one knows how to operate. And you'd literally see kids using it as like <coughs> trampoline, um, completely depressing. And now you see women coming up and trying to sell us the lights. Um, it just really changes. And then finally, um, Javad Aslam. So in, I said that with Acumen, we think the way you get the world to see beyond poverty is to invest in companies, leaders, and ideas. They often come all three together. But Javad Aslam is one of the Acumen Fund Fellows. We have a Global Fellows Program where we typically get 700 applications from about 65 countries from around the world for 10 spots. So it's quite competitive. And we're about to launch our first local program in Kenya, which we can talk about if you guys are interested later. And already, I think there have been 700 applications at least started from Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, Sudan. So we're really excited about that. But Javad was one of our earlier fellows. He's a Pakistani-American, worked in real estate, commercial real estate in Baltimore, which was where he grew up. And after 9-11, he decided he wanted to go to Pakistan and see if he, like Ayanesh, could really make a difference. Didn't know what he was going to do, but he thought that he would bring the skill set of housing. Now, Pakistan has a 7 million unit housing shortfall. Um, when I was there early in the in early 2000s, the mayor of Karachi had announced with pure hubris and certainty that they were going to build a million houses, which of course I haven't seen any being built. And Javad came in and said, well, part, part of the problem is we have no models. So we're going to build 300 houses where 2,000 people can live, and we're going to show how we do it. It starts off with this piece of land. It's about 12 miles out of the center of Lahore, Pakistan. Lahore is like the Washington, D.C. of Pakistan. Um, it's a beautiful place, very intellectual, um, and it's a place where there's also been a lot of violence, tragically. It took Javad a year and a half to register the land, again, because of the corruption in Pakistan. Um, we kept saying, look, it's patient capital. Take, take your time. We're, we've got to change the system, no matter how long it takes. But today, this place looks like this. Um, it was long. This was not a design that happened overnight. One of the things, I wish I had pictures of this for you, but one of the things that happened along the way was that um, we thought, and Javad thought, you build, a ha you build a beautiful house 12 miles out of town. And people who live in slums, if you design the payment structure to match what they paid for rent on a monthly basis, that everybody would come running for it. And that didn't happen. They built this beautiful house, they showed everybody it, it was out in this fresh air, and uh, nobody signed up. The reason they didn't sign up was because no one trusted that this, that this thing was going to be around, that there would be any jobs, that anybody would ever bother building a road long term. And then what happened is that I and some of my colleagues came to look at this beautiful house one night, afternoon, and it started to turn night. And on the way back to this village um, from the housing development with one house, we got caught in a crossfire, 50 kids with guns shooting uh, in both directions at us, which is not a fun place to be. And uh, the good news was that nobody got hurt. And the next morning, we went back, uh, not because anybody was heroic, but because the job wasn't done. And because people went back, the villagers saw how serious Javad and his team were. And that's when they started buying for the first time. Um, now, you can see some houses are, are putting Corinthian pillars in. Um, that there's the, the reason people often make decisions to buy um, is connected to status, wealth, um, connection, comfort, beauty. Uh, and so when we design systems, whether public health or public housing, not only is it entirely disrespectful to poor, poor people because we think, hey, we're, we're, we're doing this for you, so be excited about it, but it will fail because all of us really care about that stuff. But at 
at, at Saiban, which is the name of this housing community, there's one mosque. And I say that because um, last May I happened to be in Lahore when two mosques that were um, places where Emedis uh, prays, a particular sect of uh, Islam, the only Nobel laureate ever to come out of Pakistan, is an Emedi. And um, suicide bombers came and attacked the, mo the, the mosques, and 100 people were killed and many more were injured, and I was nearby. Um, and you could feel the fear, you could feel the anger growing and the resentment. But at the same time, uh, the next day we went to go visit Javad again, and I finally asked him, well, how do you guys navigate the mosque? If there's one mosque, and this is a very diverse community, deliberately diverse, not only Sunni and Shia, which are the big sects, but within Sunni Islam, many different sects where you see a lot of the ethnic fighting actually are Sunni, to, to, to Sunni all in this community. And Javad said, it took a really long time and a lot of fighting, not easy, but they finally designed a system together where the community would elect three imams. And the imams would rotate who would say Friday prayer. And the entire community, regardless of which sect to which they belong, would pray together. Um, and so what, what I keep learning through the work that we do at Ackerman Fund is that we talk about scale, and we don't want to invest in anything that doesn't reach a million people. And we're always going to be that way. But there are some models when they are small by, by nature of what they are delivering, um, have so much power in the story that they actually then start capturing the imagination of others. And this is one of those stories, because now not only do you have the thriving community, Acumen Fund has been repaid. We've now invested a million dollars in Javad's next venture, which is a for-profit housing development. And the first commercial mortgage is ever given to people who make less than $120 a month have a main in Pakistan. So there's a ripple effect that comes from these if you design them well. Right. You're not missing anything but emotion now. <laughs> have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. And so I just really do believe, particularly for your, your generation, more than any generation that's lived on the earth, that there's these two roads in front of us. And one is the road that I saw with the Emity mosques that were attacked. It is the road of fear, of hate, of pulling in, of blaming those fears on others. We see it in politics, we see it in business, we're seeing it internationally. Um, it's an easier road, but it doesn't get us to where we need to go. The other road of justice, of love, of opening ourselves is a harder road. It's a more painful road, but it's the only road that takes us where we need to go. And as I see the world moving into a single tribe where we truly need each other, like never before in history, we don't really have such a choice anymore. And for me, I think about your generation all the time. One, because I hire your generation, I adore your generation, and I think that uh, Buckminster Fuller once said that we get it all wrong when we think our elders are the ones that are old and dying. In many ways, our elders are the next generation because they're coming into a world that is so much more evolved than the world that we came into. And so we also have so much to learn from you. But this is a moment of great instability and great opportunity in the world. And in these moments, great movements are made. In our lifetime, the great movement was the Civil Rights Movement, 1950s and 1960s. And I have friends now who are in university or just out in, the, in, those, in that era that got totally involved, and I have friends that stayed on the sidelines, and now really regret that they did stay on the sidelines. But I had the opportunity of working with Dr. Robert Coles, who was a man who did not live on the sidelines ever in his life. And he worked with a young woman, a girl, six years old, named Ruby Bridges. She was the first girl in the United States to desegregate schools of the American South. Ruby was the first kid to go to a public school in New Orleans. So you can imagine, African-American, six years old, with her beautiful little dresses, every day would walk through this phalanx of angry white people screaming epithets at her, ugly faces, calling her a monster. And every day, she would look like she was talking to the people. And Dr. Coles would say, Ruby, what are you saying to the people? And she would say, nothing, what? And he would say, well, I see you talking. Finally, he couldn't stand it anymore, and he said, Ruby, 
I see you saying something to the people. What are you saying? And she said, Dr. Coles, I'm not talking, I promise, but I'm praying. And he said, so what are you praying? And she said, I'm praying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Six years old, this child was full of moral imagination, full of the understanding that we don't have good and bad people, but we have systems that are designed too often to separate and to pull out the greed and ambition rather than the angels that also exist in every one of us. And so as we look into the future, I think it's about going forth with this sense of huge audacity, but also great humility, this real commitment that we make to listening, to extending ourselves. Another one of the Ackman Fund fellows, Joseph Fat Hunga, is a guy who grew up in Western Uganda. He's a farmer. And so we placed him in one of our companies, Western Seeds, which sells hybrid seeds now to 350,000 uh, Kenyan farmers. And at the end of his stay, uh, Joseph Fat told me how humbled he was. He said, you know, I'm a farmer. I thought I knew how to reach other farmers, how to sell seeds. But I made so many mistakes, usually because of culture, often because of the women-man thing. But it really taught me that in many ways, leadership is like a panicle of rice. And I said, well, how so? And he said, because at the height of the harvest, rice is verdant, it's green, it's beautiful, and it soars to the heavens with a great sense of all that is possible. And he said, but right before the harvest, it bends over with deep humility and gratitude, and it touches the ground. And he said, for me to go forward in my life, I need to hold those two ideas of audacity and humility. And um, I think that, that the wisdom in that is something that we all need to carry. Martin Luther King said that love without power is anemic and sentimental, but that power without love is reckless and abusive. So my dream is for our generation and your generation to really have the courage to hold both simultaneously in your hands, to not be afraid to dream, and to realize that you can make this happen using the power of the markets and smart design, but also infusing it with the sense that we truly all belong to each other, and at the end of the day, all that we really have is each other. So I think I'll stop there and answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Uh, I could probably hear. Oh, it's for the video? Yeah. Let's see if any of these work. Okay, some questions. Not a time to be shy. You can ask me anything. <laughs> Whoa. I won't answer them all. Do you, do you have a name for the um, developments that Javat was working on in India? Just so I could look up a screen cap. So, for in India is Husk Power. Right. But Javat is in Pakistan, and that's called Saiban. S-A-I-B-A-N. And do you know what you're working on launching in Kenya? In Kenya, we've got um, a lot of investment. We've got Western Seeds, which is hybrid seed production. We've got um, toilets, which uh, in Kenya, 50% of the people have never, don't have access to public toilets, no sanitation. Um, open defecation is a huge issue. Uh, more than 2 billion people in the world really have no other, not, not necessarily no other option, but the option of the filthy, dirty, dangerous toilets seems a lot less attractive than a tree. And so um, it's really, really hard to introduce new toilet systems into societies where the ones that had been there were so awful or didn't exist. And so what, what this company did was decide that they would really go for beauty status um, fun as a way of changing behavior. And so they created these big toilets I mean, uh, public toilets where they've got three or four stalls on the women's side, three or four stalls on the men's side, and um, they're beautiful on the outside. They have, they have uniform people cleaning all the time, so you feel the sense of respect and, um, and safety. 
But the big innovation is they pump rock and roll music in uh, all the time. And so people literally, they come in, they start dancing, they start having fun, and this year 10 million people will use these toilets. It's a really big success story. And it's 10 million, well, not 10 million people. The toilet will be used, the toilets will be used 10 million times. Which is a really big deal. I mean, for 30 years, I worked in Kenya, and I've never seen it work. And now you have this private sector model, and it's just growing like gangbusters. And um, and the uh, um, this is Catherine Casey, one of the Acme fellows, who I have not seen. So like, that's why I've lost my voice here. Um, and she's building Acme in Ghana now. And um, the presidents of, Ga of Tanzania and Uganda want to take this model. There's also a company that is working with um, fortifying porridge, which is one of the real staples of Kenya, uh, to increase nutrition. Uh, there's a company that makes artemisinin, takes artemisinin. Artemisinin is the best known cure for malaria. Uh, so they buy it from the farmers, they process it, they turn it into coartum and it's sold through the global fund and on the open market, and right now they make about 30% of world production. So Kenya is an incredible place for us to work because we're seeing so much happen. And again, when I worked there 20 years ago, that was not the case, 25 years ago. Thank you. What about in the US? Are you doing anything here? I mean, we have some of the richest people, but we definitely also have some of the poorest. It's a great question, and we are just now starting to think about, well, what would Acme in America look like? Um, how would we do this? Uh, we hadn't done it because we were all focused on, you know, people who really have nothing. And, um, and again, what's so complex about poverty is that we work with people who have no water, no toilet, no lights, um, no education. And in the United States, I think the numbers are, are mind-boggling, something like, in hot areas, 95% of the country has an air conditioner. Um, we all have cell phones, we all have cars. Uh, from, so from a material perspective, it's not. But like you said, the divide is so great. And some innovations are starting to happen that, that are blowing us away. Like uh, I just found out about a organic um, food company, gardening company in Milwaukee that's working with prisoners. And they're showing that you can reduce recidivism rates, the, the times, number of times people go back to prison, dramatically. And so um, are getting public money as well as private money to start building up that company. And that's the kind of stuff that we would love to do. And we also would love to start sharing these lessons across national borders. So it may happen. Um, I was just wondering, as, as these um, developments get larger and larger, how are you guys able to keep, do you guys keep an overview uh, all the time, just uh, just seeing privatization of things uh, like electricity or water in other countries? Obviously, that's not the bottom-up system, but how do you guys uh, keep track of everything? Do you have people working with them as they grow? Oh, yeah. So we have um, country offices in... Kenya, uh, Pakistan, India, and then, as I said, Catherine is, is building one in Ghana. And so on the ground, we've got local teams and then advisors around those teams and, and people who give us money now um, in the community. And so when we invest for five or ten years, there are different times of a, of a company's life where we spend more or less time with the company. But um, a bank in Pakistan had a turnaround situation and we, our team members were in that company every single day. So uh, we sit on boards, we're, we're very actively involved when we make these investments and see ourselves as partners, which is why we have to be really careful to make the investment because we really get married for a decade. Um, my question is, uh, is it becoming more difficult to work in Pakistan now that after the assassination of Tasir? Um, Tasir was, was the guy who uh, dared to stand up against the blasphemy laws in Pakistan. So it's, it's easy if you're, if you're 
pushing against fundamentalism to be imprisoned there, uh, well, or killed. And so there have been a few very brave politicians that have stood up and said, we've got to get rid of this blasphemy law. And really the only two that did stand up have now been killed. So um, I think that the level of tension in Pakistan is obviously greater. And we have to be a little bit more careful about what we say um, to, to make sure our team's OK. But the things are still really moving. Things are still really working. The civil society sector, in some ways, is more important than it's ever been to <coughs> bring services to low-income people. And that, combined with the floods, and it, Pakistan has had an unbelievable year, has meant more need and more energy, I think, from elites as well as non-elites to do something. Um, are they open to like uh, Americans coming in and uh, helping them out, or are, are they kind of like defensive when you guys come in and try to help them build like new houses and things well, like that? I think it never goes. We we don't see ourselves ever as going in to help. We we really believe in building local institutions, and we see ourselves increasingly. And it's a real insight that's come to me of late that. It's so tempting when you're building out a model that you control everything from the center. And so Acme can have all these organizations around the world, but at the end of the day, it's our money, we're helping. And that, that's a broken model. And so can we really have the guts to build models and let them go in time? With rules connected to them, of course. And the letting go means you care enough about us that we share information, we, we start to learn what's happening all around the world. And that's starting to happen in Pakistan. So when I first went to Pakistan in 2002, uh, this very wise man, Saeed Babarali, said to me, here's the deal. Don't start bragging about what you're doing. Don't start asking people for money until you actually do something. And once you've proven that you are here to stay and you have actually done something, you will find that people will welcome you with open arms. And it was the best advice anyone has ever given me because we kept our head down. We didn't do a lot at the beginning because it was so hard. But we actually did what we said we would do. We had to be over-delivered. And now, I, when I said that I felt like it was my family, that was not being romantic or sweet. I feel so connected to the people with whom we work and who I love in Pakistan, that um, I don't feel like I'm leaving. People say, how can you travel so much? I feel like I'm going home. I feel the same in India, and I feel the same in Canada. But in Pakistan, I think because things are so stressful, once people decide that you're in, they just like hold you. And it's, it's amazing. So. This summer, we had interns from Japan, Jewish New Yorker. Um, right now we've got Irish Catholic Wisconsin guy uh, living in uh, Lahore and, um, and an African American from LA um, working in Pakistan. And that mix of people is also so great for everyone. I'm obviously one of the optimists. Some more questions. So I've been looking into social entrepreneurship recently, and I was going to ask, what do you think, uh, or what words of advice would you say for someone taking their first few steps into it? Um, you know, as cliche as it is, well, I guess two. The, the, the cliche is just start. You know, find your passion and make mistakes and just start. The more nuanced piece of that is sometimes you don't have, have, can't raise the money or you don't have the ability to actually start yourself. Uh, but and in that case, follow a leader more than, it almost doesn't matter what they're doing. If they lead in a way that you respect and admire, you will learn so much from them. Um, and the second piece is get your hands dirty. If you care about um, 
it doesn't matter what the issue is, and it doesn't matter where the issue is, whether it's in your neighborhood or across the world, join an organization where you're actually building something. At this age, you shouldn't be investing in other, what other people are doing. Investors are often critics, and bad critics are people who've never built anything. Good critics are people who understand what it means to fall down a hundred times to get something done. So that would be what I do. Follow the leader. Go, go to a place where you're going to have to get your hands dirty. You're going to have to learn. You're going to learn how to build. And, um, and just start. Know there are trade-offs, especially at your age. You can make five completely bad decisions and change the direction of your career and just be richer, more interesting, and more prepared for the world. Um, some more questions? Um, I think that the, uh, the examples of institutions you showed us are really amazing, but they still kind of seem like isolated examples. They still have to deal with um, corruption in the government and other things like that with the institutions that they're working within. Uh, I just wanted you to talk a little bit more about how you kind of see this business model working for the future to become more of the standard instead of the exception to make the uh, the homegrown business model kind of how every business there would work in developing worlds and kind of overcome the corruption in those governments and take a step forward. Yeah, a lot of people um, have crit criticized social entrepreneurship in general for not scaling, not, you know, well, so what? You've gotten water to a million people, 200 million people in India have no access. Um, and I have two answers. One is, nobody else has gotten into a million people, so like, let's be real. I used to be all defensive, like, wow, that's so right. I'm like, wait a minute. That, we need those models. But the second is, as they become, once you hit critical mass, whether it's 500,000 people or a million people, and there's actually a sus sustainability inside the model, then there really are opportunities for transformative change. I haven't talked about the corruption issue yet. Um, and so the example of the ambulance company is not only going to ch systematically change the way ambulance services are delivered in India, but we're already seeing it replicate in other countries. So nine ambulances is going to be the, indus is going to be the industry standard. Um, <coughs> My, what's exciting to me, which is thrilling to me, and it's new, so I'm not that articulate about it, but um, we're starting to see actually new pricing models um, and new financial instruments, like completely different than we've ever seen in history, for, um, not that we've never, we've, anything we've seen, we've seen in history, so strike that, but we haven't seen it in a long time, is, um, for instance, this social bond idea, this idea that came out in the UK with, with prisons and recidivism rates. And the way it worked is Acumen would, we haven't done it, but let's, let's say we would just use us as hypothetical. Acumen would put $10 million into a nonprofit organization that um, was working to reduce the level of recidivism at a particular set of prisons from 60%, which is the rate in the UK to 4% or whatever number we decided on. And we would be given three to five years, that, comp that organization, to prove that they'd done it. If they do it, they would have saved the government so much money by not having to feed and clothe those prisoners again, that the government would then pay them the 10 million that could come back to African Fund plus 12%. So we're starting to see the government recognizes it's not doing what it needs to do. Also, the problems are so big. If you can just imagine, India alone gets, is trying to deal right now with a million new children going into its school system every month. Every month. 12 million kids a year. And so government's not going to be able to fix that. But we're seeing these models that are starting to scale. And then how do we work with them to change policy? With water, a, a state government in India has now partnered with the company to bring water to um, at least a million people. And other copycat companies are starting. So, slow days. On the corruption front, 
I'm a real believer you just start just like what I think you should do. You just start and over time by holding to non-corruption standards, although we do find it. That's the life that we live. Um, we don't tolerate it though. By holding to those standards, we're starting to create an ethos and a group of entrepreneurs who are standing for something different. It is going to take your generation uh, a lot more transparency, shining the light on people, shaming friends as well as higher ups for this stuff to really change. But it's starting. And um, people say to me, oh, the African companies can't really be so non-corrupt. They are. Um, and like I said, I'm sure we'll find, we have been burned and we've gotten out of deals. But a, lo a lot more are than aren't. That's exciting. Over here. Hi, how are you? Um, I'm curious, maybe you can let us know a little bit how you were able to build this bridge because you started in the financial sector, right? And um, you learned a lot there, and then you were able to take all you learned to innovate in the social sector. So. I wonder how you work today to build a bridge between people on these two worlds, the same separate, but as you say, it's kind of the same tribe that needs each other, and how you were able to get, you know, people from the financial business maybe, or uh, accounting, or management or something, work and bring their minds to what you do, and also having acumen projects feed them as well. Um, well, today it's a lot easier than it was in 1986. Um, this, I would say the sectors were much more separate and there was a lot more trust. Today, your generation is changing every institution. So if you listen to Indra Noye, who is the CEO of Pepsi, she's trying to make Pepsi a health food company, in part because her employees are saying, we don't want to work at a company that's only making kids fat. And so uh, you're seeing Pepsi reach out to look for alternative ways of, of doing what it's doing. And their employees wanting to work with organizations like Acumen. I just met with um, someone at Unilever, which is another company that does a lot of um, fast moving consumer goods. And they have just partnered with Oxfam to help them transfer out of palm oil production to sunflower oil production. And they're working with now 100,000 farmers. If that thing works, you're going to see much different kinds of supply chains. So I find that we get so many applications from Wall Street, from McKinsey and consulting companies, from accounting firms, of young people who either want to work at Acumen or want to use their skills to do something for us. And I think it's, um, I think that there's, Meaning is more important to people right now than almost anything else. And that's, that's the bridge. It's the bridge of finding ways for us to be used in the way that we can be used, in a way that fills us and not just somebody else. And so it's that two-way street. Two more questions. Have you experienced a project where the implications on the culture um, were different than what you have projected? And if so, how do you negotiate that um, at the time? And, and then where do you take it? Yeah, lots. And, and again, um, I think that we're just at the beginning. And this is where the humility piece comes in. And so I'm going to answer as best I can, but there's so many different ways. Um, Water is one of the most complicated areas in which to work. It's very culturally driven. Women tend to be the water bearers. Um, rural poor don't pay for water typically. They go to swamps and wells, and the water's usually dirty, sadly. In urban areas, people pay 50 to 60 times for water what their middle class counterparts would pay. Um, with the company that we help set up and fund, what we didn't understand at the beginning which was also good news, is that women weren't coming to the plant to buy the water, only men were. 
we think it's because of the technology and because charging for the money the, for the water. And the, whereas the women bear the water on their heads, the men created a uh, delivery service. And so we thought that price was your gating factor, um, but really it, it's not. They would pay as much for the water to be delivered as the water itself. Then when the water would be taken home, women would often um, use their hands as a ladle and contaminate the water or pour the water into their clay pots for the cooling elements and the, the pots were all, all often contaminated. So culturally, this was not a big fit at the beginning. Um, lots of change, lots of marketing, and it's, it's become better. There are still parts uh, in that the company is dealing with the smarter it gets where people from the lowest caste, the Dalits, uh, are forced to live far outside the community and they don't have access. So it's not a cultural issue, it's an ethical issue as to how you then grant access. So that's one whole piece. One where I was totally, my own, I realized that we carry all these prejudices and preconceptions was in our bed net factory in Tanzania. They grew so fast that they decided to take a China Chinese model of building dormitories, going to rural villages and offering 17-year-olds the opportunity to come and work in the urban factories for 60 to 80 dollars a month, and um, all these kids, you know, signed up to come. And it's a it's it, it's a factory. You know, you sit in a sewing machine all day, and then you go to your crummy dormitory room, and there's not much to do. And these these kids came from the foothills of Kilimanjaro, where life is beautiful. And so I said to these girls, so what we're finding is that the girls typically send home half their money to their mom and dads, and then they spend the rest on body creams and cell phones and uh, makeup. And the boys send less home to their moms and dads, and then they go AWOL, and they drink, and they um, go do prostitute things, and they bring a lot of disease back to so culture is really shifting in a way that uh, the factory has to really figure out how to contend with. And they're bringing in sewing machines and dances and televisions to try to give the kids things to do. Where I was really shocked is I said to this kid, this girl's, you know, they're 17 years old, and I said, so wait a minute, let me get this straight. You would rather work here in this factory and be with all these people that you barely know than live at home in this beautiful village. And the girl said, well, at home, I spend my whole day getting water.